Ko hiriti manu tākiri mai te ata, ka o, ka o, ka awa te ati hei Māori ora. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Mike Fisher aho, and it's my privilege to uh, facilitate this Christchurch conversation uh, with Ryan Gravel tonight. Uh, and it's great to have you all here, and I'd like to acknowledge um, councillors in the room. Uh, and this series of, Re- of Christchurch Conversations is brought to you by Regenerate Christchurch and Partners Te Putahi, the Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making, and the Christchurch City Council. Uh, before we get started, a little housekeeping um, tonight. So in case of emergency, uh, please make your way calmly and quickly to the plaza outside, and the emergency exits are to the side here and at the back of the room. Uh, You're certainly welcome to take pictures during the event, um, upload them to social media, um, and this is also being live streamed uh, on Regenerate Christchurch's Facebook page, so um, it's also being videoed as well, so we'll be putting that on the website, on Regenerate Christchurch's website uh, next week. Uh, And probably a good time as well to make sure your phone is on silent, um, so we can uh, really have a good evening, lots of questions and discussion about being that, that interruption. So uh, this Christchurch Conversation series is entitled Bold Thinking in the Red Zone, and is a forum for us to gather as a community to hear from different thought leaders and discuss and debate how we might make the most of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, We do need bold thinking, and we need broad conversations to engage those people who have not been involved uh, so far or think decisions have already been made. Um, There's been lots of exciting ideas put forward uh, by individuals, interest groups in the community, And I know Regenerate Christchurch is keen to spark further public discussion and debate about the future of the area and help to stimulate new ideas and refine the existing ones. Uh, So through this Christchurch Conversation series, independent speakers will be sharing their thoughts and experiences frankly, and some of their ideas will be bold and challenging. And we hope that uh, certainly tonight with Ryan. Uh, Not everything raised by speakers uh, may apply to the red zone, and please bear that in mind that no decisions have been made about the ideas discussed. And um, we should also um, acknowledge, it's important to acknowledge, that while conversations tonight are focused on the future use of the land, we are mindful that for many past and present residents and surrounding communities, the experiences of loss and upheaval are still being felt today. Um, And if if tonight's discussion does uh, raise any further questions, please talk to um, a Regenerate Christchurch staff member. Um, Rob, I can see Rob just... And just, just down the side here, um, uh, after the end of the session. So really, I'm excited about this conversation tonight with Ryan. I've had a little bit of a chat at the back uh, with him, and it's been fantastic to hear his experience. And he's an urban planner and designer who'll share his uh, views and experiences on how cities can be transformed by catalyst projects. Uh, he'll speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, then we'll have a bit of a time for discussion, hopefully 35, 40 minutes, and and finish up at 7.30. So just a little bit about Ryan. He's an urban planner, designer, and author, working on infrastructure, uh, concept development, and policy as the founder of Six Pitch. His master's thesis thesis launched the Atlanta Beltline, which through 15 years of progress is now changing both the physical form of his city and decisions people make about living there. Alongside other projects at Six Pitch and research on similar catalyst infrastructure projects around the world, Ryan's book, Where We Want to Live, investigates this cultural side of infrastructure, describing how its intimate relationship with our way of life can illuminate a brighter path forward for our cities. So uh, thanks for joining us, and without further ado, welcome Ryan to the lectern, to the stage. Thank you for that, and thank you to Regenerate Christchurch and sorry, the organization I can't pronounce the name of, uh, that, that uh, brought me here today. It's a real honor to be here and to um, been, spend the last couple of days exploring the city, um, looking at the, talking with a lot of folks who are working on uh, making Christchurch the kind of place that we all want to live. So it's, um, it's amazing to see the sort of challenges and the opportunities that you're facing and um, be a part of that conversation. It's a real honor to be here, so thank you. Um, for, I'm going to talk, so I'm, I'm from Atlanta in the United States, and I'm an urban planner, and, um, you know, this is, uh, Atlanta. It's not exactly where I want to live, uh, necessarily, um, but we're, we're writing a new story for Atlanta, and I think that might be 
uh, what's relevant here. Um, so we're, we're writing a new story about the city. You might have heard some other stories about Atlanta, um, you know, home of Coca-Cola and Dr. King and the 96 Olympics. I don't know, there was at least one Olympian I met today that was, uh, was there. Um, another story more recently, I don't know if you've watched the show F on FX called Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, really beautiful kind of um, and very current um, and fairly accurate description of a, some kids who are trying to make a difference and make a life for themselves. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to talk about a different kind of a story. Um, I'm an urban designer and planner. I'm sort of fascinated with the role of infrastructure in shaping our lives and um, realized that when I started writing this book about infrastructure, um, that it really is a story and that, and that infrastructure tells the story of our lives. I didn't realize I was writing a story about my grandma necessarily at the time, uh, but that's her, and uh, we'll get back to her in a minute. But um, that the stories we tell um, and that are written um, in, in the physical form in the cities and the places that we live. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to see you all writing a new chapter for, for Christ Church here, um, whatever that is, and as ready for it or not as you might be. Um, that there's a there's a future being shaped here, and it's exciting to to watch it and and to hear more about it. Um, and so, in this story, you know, I I use words like y'all, and I hope y'all uh, understand what I mean by that. Um, <laughs> and um, and make some other kind of cultural references about you know stuff happening in in the United States, but that may not translate. But I think the the point is that that cities are written as stories. Um, this is, um, my story might start with my grandma, uh, but the book that I wrote that came out last year called Where We Want to Live uh, started with a year abroad that I did in Paris. This is my Metro card uh, picture. Um, and my friend says I look like a French anarchist, uh, <laughs> but this is still what I see when I look in the mirror in the morning. Uh, no better place really to be 22 and studying architecture uh, for a year abroad and um, really changed the way that I saw the world. Within a month, I had lost 15 pounds. I was in the best shape of my life because I was eating fresh food and I was walking wherever I went. And the role of the physical city um, in, in, in my life became clear to me in a way that had really never been before. And I became fascinated with the role of the city, uh, the physical city in shaping um, our way of life. Um, that infrastructure in particular and public space isn't just about moving people from point A to point B or conveying water or sewer or utilities or whatever, that infrastructure is really the foundation for our economy and it's the foundation for our cultural life and for our social life. And so it matters um, what we build to the way that we live. And if we're more thoughtful about it, we might make different decisions. Um, and so this idea that infrastructure is shaping our way of life became sort of my focal point as I finished college and came back um, to Georgia Tech um, in the late 90s to study uh, architecture and urban planning and became fascinated with the role of uh, infrastructure in shaping um, the great you know, uh, industrial cities of the American, um, of America and, um, and that they also similarly created a different a way of life for people. They tapped into the resources and the, um, the natural resources and opportunities created that, that, that formulated, that created cities. Um, they also came at, at, at a cost um, that cities at that time, industrialization had a lot of challenges. Um, they were dirty, they were uh, environmental contamination. This is the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland on fire, which happened several times. Um, and the social unrest and the overcrowded housing conditions um, created a, a, a rea we had a reaction to that culturally, um, and our reaction was that we wanted to get away from cities, from the, get away from the pollution and the social unrest, and, and escape to the countryside. And so we started building a new infrastructure that supported that um, in highways and roadways. And that's where my grandparents come in. They, were, they got married in 1941, and my grandfather was a banker, and his boss convinced him to buy a house out on the edge of town. Um, and they participated in that way in the sort of classic story of American suburbanization. They rented rooms to servicemen during World War II. Um, they probably got one of those fancy federal home loans that was only available to white people. 
Um, they participated in white flight out of the city. And, you know, not, not good, obviously, but they played a role in, in a story, in a national story of suburbanization and that really ch fundamentally changed the way that, that we live. Uh, we were laying the groundwork for urban sprawl at that time, but we didn't call it sprawl. You know, we called it the future, and it was. Um, and you can't separate the physical form of the city from the other things that were happening at that time, which were very visionary. Um, we were sending people to the moon, and science was curing disease. The sexual revolution was breaking down barriers. The civil rights movement had begun its march toward the fulfillment of our nation's promise. And all of these things are happening at the very same time that the private sector is innovating in new technologies for automobiles and air conditioning and fast food and entertainment. And the public sector is innovating in new uh, kinds of infrastructure to support that way of life. Literally, engineers going from one city to another city to look at the configuration of some new roadway or the comp composition of some material for driving on. Um, there was this, the, the public and private sector t together in that way kind of colluded on giving us the lives that we wanted and fueled the sort of cycle of change that, that really radically changed the way we build cities. Which cuts back to my family. So we moved from a small town in Louisiana to metropolitan Atlanta uh, to take advantage of the booming economy that was a direct result of all the highways that we were building in the 1970s. Uh, my dad took a job with an engineering firm designing pump stations and wastewater treatment plants to support the sprawling economy of the region. We bought a house in a neighborhood that was incentivized by the construction of our perimeter highway. Um, we were living lives that were um, part of that cultural uh, development of the country. And, um, and it put dinner on our table and it sent me to college and, and it did what city building infrastructure is supposed to do. Um, it wasn't available to everybody, it wasn't inclusive in that way and I think it's important to note especially as we look forward. But you can see the cycle of change there, that, that, that the, our cultural perspectives change the infrastructure we build, our infrastructure changes the way that we live and that kind of cycle and in the process really radically changed even what the definition of a city is and certainly how we live in it. Um, and so and we, were we were building more than just infrastructure at that time, you know, building a way of life. And that's the way of life that I grew up in. That's what my cultural expectations growing up look a lot like that picture. Um, so now, of course, there's similar challenge, you know, this new set of challenges of chronic disease and obesity and diabetes and um, time wasted in cars. And people are kind of sick of traffic congestion and sprawl and all of that. And so you look at what's happening around us, around cities right now, we're in a very different kind of time. Um, are we, you know, you have to ask yourself, are we stuck with this dystopian kind of traffic in a region like Atlanta? Um, the environmental degradation of the last, you know, century, the urban displacement and the social and environmental inequities uh, in cities, um, the suburbanization of poverty, which is uh, really significantly growing in Atlanta. Um, the uh, social isolation of the way that we built our lives, that we literally don't anymore. And certainly I know you might have some opinions about our, our new national politics, but that's at least partly um, connected to the physical world that we live in, that we don't see each other, we don't connect with each other, and therefore we don't learn empathy for people who are different. And that physical uh, separation and social isolation really per is, shapes the way that we live our lives and, and, and the decisions that we make. And so, you know, finishing graduate school in 1999, I never, um, I wasn't thinking about all that, of course, but that was, that was the context that I was coming up in. And I came up, I was studying architecture and planning and uh, needed a thesis project that would bridge those two disciplines um, with this sort of cultural context. Um, and that's where I came up with this idea for the Atlanta Beltline, uh, which was my graduate thesis in 99. And it's built around these uh, railroads that circle, um, circle the downtown area. They were built after the American Civil War. So Atlanta's a railroad town, it was built by the railroads. Um, these were built later to service, to create an industrial belt around circling the city. Um, and they attracted a lot of industry. So the yellow there is the uh, industrial air, uh, land uh, factories and stuff that followed that, that railroad corridor. Um, after the civil, after uh, everybody got sort of um, 
fascinated with cars and suburbanization. All of this was left behind. The neighborhoods went into decline. The city lost a fifth of its population. And most ultimately, a lot of the industry moved outside of town. So my idea was to repurpose this loop of old railroads with some life-affirming new infrastructure that would uh, incentivize the redevelopment of all that land and revitalize the communities in the process. Uh, I never uh, imagined we would actually build it. I just wanted to graduate, uh, which I did, <laughs> fortunately, um, and just went off to, um, to, to, to a job. But the project, the loop is 35 kilometers long. It's 30 to five kilometers out from downtown in any direction as a radius. 45 different neighborhoods on, along the way, uh, on one, often on one side of the tracks or the other. So there's a real difference there in sort of socioeconomic um, history. Um, about 100,000 people currently within walking distance to the corridor and about 2,000 hectares of land along that industrial belt that is you know, ripe for redevelopment and reposition. You can see how close it is to the city uh, there. And then even though you're that close, it feels like you're out in the country uh, a lot of the time. So I graduated uh, in 99. I went to work for an architecture firm. We did, we did a lot of mixed-use urban infill type projects where you take a big tract of land, uh, you know, redevelop it, either into, use old industrial buildings for lofts or apartments or build new infill kind of uh, housing. Uh, after the uh, generation or two of decline, the city had started to grow right around the early uh, 2000s. And so a lot of developers were just taking advantage of that and, and we were doing that kind of work. And, there was this one project, it was 20 acres, we were trying to decide, do you take the parking garage and jam it up against the old abandoned railroad, or do you orient the project toward the railroad, hoping it would become something better one day? And I was telling my coworkers about this idea I had in school, and they thought it was cool because we were doing a lot of work in the corridor, and, um, and they lived in neighborhoods along the way, and so uh, we just started talking about it. And the more people we talked to, the more people wanted to hear about it. And in the summer of 2001, we sent out a letter at, and some maps to everybody we could think of, the mayor, the governor, um, all the regional planning agencies, the State Department of Transportation. We got a lot of nice letters on letterhead saying, you know, nice idea, good luck with that. Um, but got a great response from Kathy Willard. She was on city council. She was chair of the transportation committee, which usually deals with our airport, which you may have passed through. It's the busiest airport in the world. The city happens to own it, um, and, but that's usually what they focus on. But she was interested in public transit, and she was particularly, um, the city of Atlanta is only a fraction of the region, and she had called in all the agencies to say, you know, what are you doing for the city of Atlanta from a public transit standpoint? And they uh, had all these ideas of moving people from way outside of town into downtown and back home at, at the end of the day, not really for people who live in the city who are more likely to want transit, more likely to ride transit, more likely to pay for transit, have been paying for transit for 30 years with our agency at the time, and um, a large proportion of people who are dependent on transit to get around because they can't afford a car. There was basically nothing for anybody there. And she was frustrated by that meeting and she went back to her office that day, this letter was on her desk, and she thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, so she called us in, we told her more about the project. She said, let's see what happens. And so we, had a, we did a town hall meeting in her district and the neighborhood fell in love with the idea. We did a few more of those um, and then she was elected city council president. This is 2001 and, and, for the, and so we took the conversation citywide and for the next um, two and a half years, I was doing two and three public meetings a week as a volunteer and so was she and her staff and a handful of volunteers and the citizens of Atlanta really fell in love with this vision for their future um, that they hadn't really been offered before um, that was positive. And, um, and so it just started to gain momentum. And we built this amazing coalition of people, part uh, community organizers, community advocates, who mostly had been fighting against things, you know, for the onslaught of the 20th century, the sort of bad news of the American sort of center city, uh, classic kind of story. Um, they were fighting against all those things and found the Beltline as something as they could fight for. Um, the developers who saw the new population growth in the city and saw it as an opportunity to make a buck, they were on board. And then all the nonprofit uh, organizations in town, the advocates for housing, for trees, for 
um, bicycles or pedestrians, any number of sort of specific issue-driven nonprofit organizations saw their mission at least partly accomplished in this vision, uh, but they were part of something bigger. And so they, those groups are not used to being at the same table, wanting the same outcome, so it was really weird. Um, but there we were, and uh, it was also really powerful, and it got the project moving in a really uh, amazing uh, kind of way. And so in a way that the, and there you can see how the, the corridor is like this abandoned railroad and flanked on either side by this industrial territory, which is mostly obsolete or abandoned. And then on either side of that are these neighborhoods that Atlanta really loves and are sort of in the midst of revitalizing. So it's a perfect situation where you reuse that corridor for something else, and then that incentivizes the growth in that industrial belt. So the idea, I think I might have forgotten to mention what that corridor is used for, is um, for the whole uh, 35 kilometers uh, transit line, a tram, and a Maltese trail. Um, and then that would spark economic development in neighborhoods that, were, um, that hadn't seen anything new in 30 or 40 years. And then neighborhoods that were already growing, it was a way to manage that growth in a way that was sustainable. And then connecting existing parks and cultural centers, the botanical gardens, the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library is on the line, the Martin Luther King Historic District, um, the zoo, those kinds of things are already on the quarter. So it connects those kinds of things. Um, what was amazing is that um, as we started that conversation, built that movement, the idea started to grow. The Trust for Public Land, which is a national not land conservation organization um, came in and said, that's cute that you guys want to connect 700 acres of parks, existing parks, but what about building 1,400 acres of new parks um, carved out of that industrial belt, including the uh, top picture there, which is the old quarry, uh, which will be the, now the city's largest park. Um, it's also the quarry itself, a reservoir that serves as additional 30 days of emergency drinking water for the city, so really aligned in that way. The mayor of Franklin at the time said, what better place for uh, affordable housing than on a transit line where you can afford to not have a car, and now it's the largest affordable housing initiative in the city's history. That's great for new um, housing, but what about um, existing residents who are low or fixed income and, and they're facing rising taxes and rents, and now there's a, a slew of uh, community stabilization kind of pro processes in, in place, and we've got a long way to go on that, but, uh, but it is a part of the project. Uh, public art and historic preservation, and Trees Atlanta came up with this idea of a 22-mile linear arboretum, uh, public health communities involved, and brownfield remediation, and you know, the idea, because the public owns this idea, then they always bring something to it. They bring their own ideas, and they layer that on to this larger vision. And so, you know, the bocce ball association wants to put bocce ball courts around it, and the um, farmer's market, people want to put farmer's markets around it. And so whether the ideas are big or small, the, the project is this sort of um, infrastructure for armature for, for people's ideas and the aspirations that they have for their own future, uh, which is really cool. Uh, I could bore you to death with all the planning and all the agencies and all the people that are involved in pulling this thing off. I'm happy to uh, answer questions about that uh, when we get there, but just understand that the best cities in the world are built from lots of different perspectives. They're, in, they're inherently complex, and we have to bring everybody to the table. So that's although the public, profit, and nonprofit sector. Um, and this is what the quarter part of it would look like. The cool thing is that we're not just drawing pretty pictures and planning, we're actually uh, building it. This is the East Side Trail. Uh, a two-mile section on the east side, which uh, was built in 2012, um, really already changing the way that we uh, see the project in the city. Uh, several new parks, this is the historic Fourth Ward Park, which doubles as a uh, stormwater retention facility, um, and that's protecting downstream areas from flooding. Um, we, you can see that we're only in the early stages of implementation. The um, blue lines are built trails, uh, the block is uh, underway, under construction. Those two pieces will open um, before the end of the year. Uh, no transit yet, although we did just um, uh, vote for a transit referendum for a sales tax last November. Maybe the only good news coming out of the American election. <laughs> um, but you can. See, but it's allowing us. To, will, it, it will allow us to sort of build a project out over the next 15 years. Um, 
and, the, and to amazing success already. We've spent about $450 million so far. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen over 3.7 billion in private sector investment as a direct result along the quarter, including this building, which is the old Sears and Roebuck distribution facility. It's right on the corridor, corridor. it's 2 million square feet. It's a massive redevelopment with a food hall and retail and housing and office, a uh, real magnet for a uh, new uh, generation of, of growth along this corridor. Um, more importantly, of course, it's building an infrastructure for ourselves and for our lives. Um, this is what that quarter looked like just a few years ago. You can see the old Sears building in the background there. This is basically what it looks like today. Um, it, this picture was taken a few years ago. I was actually on my bike taking my kids for a bike ride and you know, they're way up front and I'm in the back taking pictures with my phone, you know, trying not to have a wreck. And uh, I get home and I was sort of flipping through my pictures and I realized that this is my favorite picture I've ever taken working on this project in the 15 years at the time that I've been working on it. And it wasn't because it's a particularly good picture. It's not because it's a beautiful spring day where the leaves had just burst out and beautiful blue sky. It's not because people are walking by literally talking about how in love they are with their city again. It's because of this woman on the right with the red hair. She's carrying her groceries. And in the process, she's validating what we always said the Beltline would do, that would make a way of life possible that just wasn't possible before. Um, she's changing people's lives in really profound and important kinds of ways. And that's before the trail is even done, it's before the transit is in, it's before all the ramps and stairs are built. It's only on this little sh short two mile piece of a large, much larger kind of corridor. Um, there's a Whole Foods actually right off the picture, the grocery store, but you can't even get there because there's no way down. You can't, there's no ramp or stair to get down there. So if the project is already changing our lives this much already, imagine how much more change is coming. It's really exciting and also maybe a little scary. Um, but it gets me back to my, my own story because this is a story, again, about people and the lives that we lead. Um, you know, we li my family lives on it. We live in a loft uh, right on the corridor. I ride my bike in Atlanta uh, to work in the morning, six minutes uh, without crossing a street. Um, pretty amazing. Um, I was, but I love this story because I was uh, taking my kids to the grocery store a couple months, uh, last summer, and um, they were complaining about it, you know, because they didn't want to go. They didn't want to get in a car and get stuck in traffic, basically. And they said, oh, Dad, you know, if we have to go, can we at least ride our bikes? And I said, yeah, of course we can ride our bikes. That's what people in Atlanta do, you know. We ride our bikes to the grocery store. They don't know how ridiculous that is, you know. Um, but it's really powerful that that's their expectation for Atlanta, and that's their expectation for their lives. And so when you look ahead at all the challenges that, all the challenges that we're facing as a city, as a region, as a country, as a, as a, as a planet, um, it gives you hope that we, there's actually a chance uh, to solve that, to, get, to find those answers and to implement them because it's, it's not happening because we're making specific arguments about any particular project. It's happening because of a cultural momentum um, that's changing the way that we live and, the, and what our expectations are for our lives. And so what's, and to emphasize that, I will, I'll sort of expand, step back from the Atlanta Beltline and, and sort of talk about some other projects very briefly. Um, one of the amazing things about, you know, my life right now is that I get to come to Christ Church and other cities and, and share our story. Um, and every city I go to, um, there's something similarly, similarly interesting and, and, and fascinating happening there, um, that what we're doing is not an anomaly. It's part of a larger kind of cultural momentum that's changing cities everywhere. And it's cool to see that. Um, if you, and I'll run through these pretty quickly, but this is the High Line in New York, which you may be familiar about with. It's gotten a lot of uh, press. Um, it's a elevated railroad through the east, west side of Manhattan. It's only a mile and a half long. Um, it's a garden, you know, linear garden scape walking area. You can you can't take your dog up there or, or even, or certainly your bike, but, it's, but it has a similar grassroots kind of story. It's really fundamentally changing the economics of and the and impact of um, where people live and all that in, in Manhattan. It's now the largest uh, tourist destination in New York City, which says quite a lot, um, of course. 
but that's a high profile one, but there's lots of others. This is the uh, rail park in Philadelphia, which is a third in this stunningly beautiful tunnel, a third below street grade, but open to the sky, and a third like the High Line, sort of lifting over the city streets. They just broke ground in their first phase um, of rethinking what this, this old railroad corridor would be. But it's not just old railroads, this is the Green Line in Toronto. It's a power line easement, basically, that's being converted with uh, linear, uh, linear trails, gardens, um, playgrounds for kids and community gardens, uh, pretty interesting on the north side of Toronto. In Minneapolis, um, this is, a, like the Beltline, a sunken railroad below street grade, uh, existing trail they built about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. The space to the left is being reserved for a tram. Uh, same thing in Detroit, the Dequinder Cut, uh, trail on the right, future tram on the left. In Salt Lake City, they built the tram, so that's more or less what the Beltline will look like. We've got a little bit more space between our trail and train. Unfortunately, we don't have the beautiful uh, mountain range in the distance. Um, but it's a similar kind of concept. This is a much smaller project. Um, so uh, this is uh, in Singapore, a 15-mile abandoned railroad that c crosses the entire country island. Um, and fascinating, they see the Atlanta Beltline as a primary model for what they want to do. Less about the physical transformation of the rail corridor, although that's part of it, and more about they're looking for to create an infrastructure that supports the communities along the way and gives them the life that they want, which is pretty amazing uh, sort of uh, perspective to take um, and, and, and humbling, of course, here from Atlanta to hear that. Um, in New Orleans, there's a project called the Lafitte Corridor. It was originally a portage route between the the bayou, the shipping uh, area, and the backside of the French Quarter. Um, and then they dug it out as a canal to serve the same purpose for 150 years. And then they filled in the canal and built a railroad, and then they abandoned the railroad, and now it just opened last summer as the Lafitte Greenway up through Treme, which is beautiful. This is the underline in Miami, a 10-mile uh, elevated 1980s era transit line that goes from downtown out through Coral Gables in South Miami. This is the before condition. They're in the process of renovating the entire space below as this new greenway that has a connections to the university and to, um, to different neighborhoods, economic development and all that. Really amazing project in Miami. In, in Houston, um, which is a very flat city with uh, poor soil, so it drains very slowly. They have these bayous that sort of, in their native condition, sort of want meander very slowly out to sea. Well, the engineers got a hold of it uh, last century and sort of streamlined and straightened them. They got rid of all that pesky vegetation and wildlife and uh, tried to get that water as fast out to sea as possible. It didn't work. It didn't stop the city from flooding. And so now they're reimagining those again. Um, like the old railroads had been degraded over time, backed up, covered with highways and power lines and all kinds of things, and now being rethought, repurposed, redesigned and reanimated with, with human life, and it's really beautiful what they've done. They've taken the idea of Buffalo Bayou and translating it now into 10 bayous across the entire region, which is beautiful. The mother of all these projects, though, is the Los Angeles River. I don't know if y'all even knew that LA had a river, except every post-apocalyptic movie coming out of Hollywood. Um, it's amazing to see, uh, I think it's beautiful, but I'm just kind of funny that way. Uh, but the Army Corps of Engineers, a federal agency, uh, paved the LA River in the 1930s, paved 80% uh, of a 50 mile long river with concrete uh, for flood control and protection. And, um, but there's been this grassroots movement since the 80s to reclaim it as some kind of life affirming river again. And, um, and they've made amazing progress to the point where just a couple years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers, which paved it originally, just agreed to a $1 billion restoration, one little short piece of the river. So when we talk about this sort of cultural momentum, the cultural change that's happening, it's not just in the um, physical transformation of cities. It's, it's not just changing the way that we think about the cities and the, way, and the places that we live. It's changing the way that the, both the public and private sector build the world around us. We're creating agencies, we're uh, modifying their policies to shape, to reshape this change. So the more change we get, the more easier it will get, be. Um, I was talking to my friend, the woman who started the Underline Project in Miami, and she calls me all the time. She's like, I'm, in, I'm standing in front of the Florida legislature, and I, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, exactly, you know, you just, 
you don't have to know what you're talking about. You're participating, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're creating something new and we're, we're, we have new ideas about what we want from cities and we're not gonna get those changes necessarily from uh, some of our leaders, so we have to do it ourselves. And so that's, that's, a, that's the kind of uh, change that we're talking about. Um, it, but it doesn't have to be just big giant projects like the LA River or the Beltline in Atlanta. Uh, this is a very simple project in Indianapolis where you know, they built their streets too wide downtown, there aren't enough cars to fill them, and so they just reclaimed some of that space for this new uh, cultural trail that forms a loop immediately around downtown, connects their art museum to some other cultural, cultural destinations, and in the process completely reframes the way that people see the city, the way they move around downtown, and uh, has really animated uh, life there, which is uh, pretty cool to see. Um, and you know, so it's, the whole point of all that is it's creating a way of life for, for people. Um, it's ju not just in infrastructure. So what my book does is it, uh, it tells a story of this relationship between culture, our way of life, and infrastructure. It talks about urban sprawl uh, in Atlanta. It talks about the story of the Beltline. Um, and then it connects it to all these other projects. And the way that that is framed is through these eight lessons that these projects, the most successful aspects of these uh, projects can be captured in these eight, eight lessons. And so um, I'll just walk quickly through those. Um, the first is that the best projects are big projects. I don't mean geographically big, although that's part of it, um, but that they're, in a way, the bigger the idea, uh, the more compelling it is to people. And the more, you know, these are hard projects to do. They're expensive, uh, they're big, they're politically complex, they're logistically, technically complex. And so you need big ideas in order to compel the momentum forward to keep it going. Um, and so in a way, the bigger and more inclusive that idea is, the better. Um, the, second I, the second lesson is about that inclusion, is including everybody. So for example, a trail isn't just a trail project, because trails are great for um, able-bodied people who are able to do that. Uh, but you know, including everybody is part of that story, and not, not um, every sector of the population, every age, um, being thoughtful about how they can participate in it so they have some ownership in it so that they will support it also, and it'll make a better, a better project. The third is about authenticity, that there's something really great about these projects that they tap into what that city is about. Atlanta is a railroad town, that's why it exists. And we're repurposing this loop of old railroads for, um, for something new for our future. LA is where it is because of the river. Um, they just forgot about it for uh, several generations and now they're reclaiming it as a central element of their future, which is really beautiful. So there's something, unlike sprawl, which sort of makes every, every city look like every other city, um, these, these kinds of projects tap into the identity of a place and, and make it special. Because I think that all of us uh, want to live somewhere special. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most special place in the world but it has to have some kind of meaning and we have to have, feel connected to it. And that's what these, a lot of these projects do. The fourth thing is to think about uh, is that, and this is I think relevant here, is um, that the best projects uh, compel change. They're not really the change themselves. So you're gonna be talking about what you wanna do with this opportunity, uh, but what, what you're really talking about is what kind of lives you're trying to create for yourself and what you wanna do with that. And, and how this can support uh, what that life is. So you're compelling change. Um, the fifth is about design, uh, that it matters. Um, design matters to how it, design can make things really work well for communities. It can also prevent it from working well if it's bad design, so being thoughtful about that. Um, the sixth, I love this one because uh, it's about just staying focused on this idea, on the vision for what you're trying to accomplish. If we had started talking about the Beltline with how we were gonna pay for it, we never would have done it. There's just no way. It's too expensive. It's too, too complex. Um, but all the funding, the politics, all the technical stuff, engineering, should be put in service to the idea, um, not the other way around. And so it's hard to do it, especially with a lot of uh, committee meetings and you know, public meetings and all that. But it, I, the idea to stay, to stay focused on on what you're trying to achieve. 
The seventh is uh, to emphasize people, uh, to make sure that people are included. Most of these projects start with communities uh, aspiring to something different and wanting something from their, for their lives. And it's important to keep that engagement uh, uh, around throughout the implementation process and, and, and through the end for lots of reasons, uh, for ownership of the corridor, for supporting uh, the planning and uh, funding processes, uh, but ultimately for the uh, success of the, of the corridor that it, or, or the project that it actually achieves the outcomes. It requires the people who are actually gonna use it to be part of defining uh, what that is. And the last is to band together, which is like these projects are just messy. You know, there, there's lots of agencies and organizations, there's lots of perspectives, there's lots of different opinions about it, and you just have to be willing to, not everybody, ag agree that not everybody's gonna agree, but that you're willing to work together uh, toward a common sort of outcome. Um, in light of that, I was gonna share just a few minutes on, a, on another project that I'm working on that's sort of taking some of those lessons and the idea from the Beltline and expanding it um, to the city as a whole because as I started with the picture of the traffic, Atlanta's kind of national identity is around traffic congestion, which is not exactly what we want it to be, uh, for, especially for those of us who live there. That's not what we want for our lives. And so, but we're also facing a lot of change, like a lot of cities uh, growing very rapidly in, the, in their center city and excited about that and all the opportunities that it creates, but also a little nervous about that it's gonna create a city that we don't recognize anymore. And so uh, about a year and a half ago, I started working with the city of Atlanta, leading this project called the City Design, which is about figuring out who we are as a city, what our, what our identity is, so that we can then, uh, so that all the things that we do, the investments that we make, the policies that we set can support that, that sense of our identity. Um, Atlanta's not the kind of city like you know, New York or Paris that has a very clear civic identity. Um, where you can imagine those, those cities in 20 years, you know, you can kind of see what they're gonna look like. Atlanta, you don't even know what it looks like now, much less in 20 years. Um, so the idea was to, to figure that out and, and then start to give that some shape and some form. And when we started thinking about what that was, um, we realized very quickly that Atlanta's contribution to the world is a legacy of the civil rights movement. And that, um, and that what Dr. King talked about uh, when he talked about the beloved community, was that it was a place, it wasn't some abstract kind of utopia, but it was an actual place that, where everybody was welcome. Um, and it was a city that was built, designed and built for everybody. Um, and I love the word he used, aftermath. He said the aftermath of the civil rights movement was the beloved community. And so it's a big aspiration to take on, but also one that uh, is unique to Atlanta and special um, place that, that this happened here for reasons in Atlanta for a reason, and that we want to live, live up to it um, and also carry it forward and, and, and discover what that would look like. And so what we did was we looked back through our history, uh, trying to understand what it was that made Atlanta into that kind of a place that, where that could happen, and then trans looking ahead um, since then, at, it's what ha has happened since, and understanding how that all comes together and then we identified five core values um, that are, reflect who we are when we're at our best. You know, not, not who we are when we're at our worst, because you don't want to really aspire to that. But when we're at our best, like what are those values? And then rather than organize all the things that we do, all the projects and policies that we set um, around sort of silo kind of things like transportation or housing or art, instead of that, which don't really necessarily relate to each other directly, we're organizing all those things around these core values and we're making them accountable uh, to those values um, so that we can become, over time, a better version of ourselves, leverage that growth to become a better version of ourselves, and not some other place that we don't really like or recognize anymore. Um, and so it's important because the city is going to change. The region is gonna go from five and a half million to eight in 20 years. Um, and the city of Atlanta, which I mentioned is a fraction of that, still will nearly triple its population during that time frame. And so we are excited about that, but also uh, quite anxious about it. It's already sort of changing um, the dynamics of a lot of the population of the city, and so we wanna be thoughtful. So real quickly, the idea about equity is, the, is that it's hard work um, that's unappreciated, uh, but it's essential to make sure that 
that the benefits of this change that's coming, that, that they accrue, accrues fairly to everyone. And so these are ideas about uh, policy priority, the investment priority about things to make sure that they're uh, impacting different populations and different geographical neighborhoods sort of equally. It's about civic participation and being a welcoming place to other, uh, uh, other kinds of uh, po specific populations. Progress is the hard work of achieving that equity, which Atlanta has a history of in the civil rights movement, very hi highly negotiated peacefulness in that era. Um, and so basically we want to make sure that we, in the, in the process of change, that we're protecting things that have value, um, meaning, that have meaning in the face of the economic pressures. Um, so this is about housing, affordability, innovation, preservation, social engagement. Ambition is about, um, creating, you know, that people have dreams, and Atlanta's sort of a dreamer kind of town. The Beltline is a great example of that. Uh, so is the Olympics or Coca-Cola, all these kinds of things happen to the city. We have big ideas, but ideas aren't really enough if you don't have opportunity. And so making sure that Atlanta is a place where there are opportunities for everyone. So business innovation, incubation, um, arts and culture, public life and education, all kinds of uh, policies. And each one of these has a slew of sort of recommendations that goes around it. Access of, is about the physical infrastructure of, those, of that opportunity, so making sure that we are building a new kind of infrastructure that supports that, um, those outcomes, but also in a way that um, creates a sense of place and community for the, for the people who live here. And then the last is nature, the natural environment that on which the city is sort of built. Um, Atlanta has a beautiful tree canopy. We want to protect and expand that through land conservation, green infrastructure, green building, that kind of stuff. And so the end of it, sort of come, all those different kinds of things align with this new uh, sort of phys physical condition of Atlanta that isn't, isn't really something new. Um, it's just articulating the way that the city already is, uh, but in a way that people aren't used to seeing. And so uh, describing that future city um, around these corridors, this, this balance between urbanization and uh, the conservation of the tree canopy and the watersheds. And then, and then projects that achieve that kind of outcome. This is the, I mentioned the Quarry Park. This is the uh, construction of that reservoir, the tunnel that will connect it to the river. Uh, is being bored right now by a boring machine called Driller Mike, if you're familiar at all with the hip Atlanta hip hop scene, uh, Killer Mike. Uh, Driller Mike is on its way to the Chattahoochee River. Um, but it's, it's a great example of how these things come together, uh, that it's, uh, it's a, an investment in equity because it's underserved kind of communities and tapping into uh, opportunities there, progress, um, all ambition. It sort of pulls all these ideas together. That, so there's the end of the, pro, end of the city design is about the big compelling ideas, not just the Beltline, but other things that the city needs to do to compel us to action and politi politically support uh, the changes that are required to live up to that really enormous kind of aspiration. And so I've got a minute or two left to describe uh, why all this matters, and hopefully you all are gathering a few questions because we have a fair amount of time for that. Um, but why, you know, I don't want to get cheesy on you guys, but, you know, it matters. These are my kids and, and, and lots of kids. You know, we're, this, these are projects that outlive us and will be done, finished long after uh, we're gone. And, you know, we really are create this, their future is changing. Uh, the needs that the to create opportunities for them, we have to invest in that future. Um, and, it, and the future wants something else. And so being sort of thinking about that and then creating the kind of lives that we want. This lady is, cracks me up. She's, uh, you know, the New York Times comes to town and they, they're talking about the Beltline, you know, 22 miles and that George Tech student and blah, blah, blah. But they focus on her. You know, I don't usually you know, play my violin, walking down the belt line, tugging my dog on the back of a cooler, but she, <laughs> but she's out there all the time, and I see her a lot, and um, she's living the life that she wants, you know, and she's making the rest of our lives uh, richer in the process. Um, and so you see people out there, and this is my, me taking my daughter's Girl Scout troop on a, on a ride on the belt line, my morning commute, uh, my sweet dog's last walk. You know, these are the places that people uh, live their lives in every season, at every time of day. There's a lot of people out there getting exercise or going to work, uh, but there's also people out there on dates, you know? I mean, women in like serious heels, you know, that's not, they're, out, they're not out for a jog. You know, they're organizing their social lives around this thing that's really just 
infrastructure, you know, but it's creating a way of life for people that's uh, really fascinating uh, to watch. This is my daughter on the right. That's her worldview. That's her expectation for Atlanta. This is your average uh, weekday winter afternoon. This is no, not a special day. And um, that's her expectation that Atlanta is the kind of place you, know, you can ride your bike to the grocery store or pretty much anywhere else, which is just astonishing to anybody who's been there. Um, this is a woman I met a couple years ago. Uh, she liked the transit a lot. You know, she thought the parks were going to be nice and the trails and all that. But what she was really interested in is the economic uh, 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 development that was going to come to her, the economy that was going to come to her community. Um, she's a fashion designer. She's a new business owner. You can see her models in the background in the photo shoot. Um, the Beltline will bring to her and her community an economy to support her business, to put her put dinner on her table, to send her kids to college in the same way that those highways did for my parents and my family a generation ago. And it's really cool to see that, um, that happening um, today. Uh, this is a picture of what we call the Lantern Parade, uh, which I love to end on because it's just such a great story. Um, it's this woman, she came from New Orleans. She had a different kind of perspective on, on parades, that there's not something that you merely watch, but that you participate in them. And that why wouldn't people make homemade lanterns and walk down the trail in the dark? And uh, so the first year she did it, the trail wasn't even finished. It was just, the, they had ripped up the, trail, the tracks from the railroad, but it was just dirt. And she had about 200 people out. It's pretty amazing. And then the next year, there are about 400 people. And the next year, there are about 800 people. And the next year, there are about 1,200 people. And the next year, there were 12,000 people. And the next year, there are 22,000 people. The next year, there are 60,000 people. And last September, there are over 75,000 people out there, literally, literally with homemade lanterns that they'd made, uh, walking down the trail in the dark. And that's enough to like stack people like six or eight wide, packed tightly for the whole two-mile stretch of the East Side Trail. Uh, just for hours, just passing by, and just this amazing um, story of humanity and excitement and kids and it's free and family and stuff is just an, a truly amazing thing. And the point is that it's a, it's a cultural kind of outcome. It's something that would only happen because we built that infrastructure, that two-mile slab of concrete, but it's something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And so I'm talking about cultural in infrastructure, um, that's really... Uh, what I'm talking about. So we have a long way to go before we're uh, finished, um, and we have a lot of really critical issues to make sure that uh, the project reflects um, its best sort of outcome, uh, but we're certainly on our way. And I think it's important to understand in these kinds of projects that we have to talk about these things. We have to be willing to engage in them, and we have to be comfortable with the answer being, I don't know, and we're going to figure it out. Uh, but we also have to do things. We have to act and you know, find, actually implement things to, to start this ball moving. So anyway, that's, that's sort of my story. But um, it's really great to be here and, um, and to participate in this conversation. So thank you. OK. Wow. Um, that was amazing. It's so powerful um, stuff, and it's, I mean, it's amazing trying to collect my thoughts and think, what questions can I <laughs> can I ask? Because there's, there's grassroots movement, there's partnerships, um, the power of infrastructure, the power of ideas, uh, sort of embracing our stories. And I think um, oh, great to see the audience. Um, we're going to have some mics that are go around, um, so we want to see some questions and, and start to have a conversation with Ryan. Um, I might start if, if that's okay. Uh, I'll just put it on to that. Um, I'm interested, and in you've put up some slides, and there's a lot of people involved in this, starting from some of the ideas that you oh, had yeah. early on, and your colleagues, right. and then public sector and grassroots community. What are, what are some of the tools um, that sort of brought those people together, the, the things that brought that together, and, and also beyond political cycles? This is a, a, a sure. project beyond many years. Well, as I said, I mean, it's a very organic sort of process. It wasn't really planned out how this was going to work. And because it started with community, because the people of Atlanta believed in this really before anybody else, um, they're the ones who sort of started the engine, you know, going. And, uh, and oblig ultimate, empowered, but ultimately obligated their elected officials to follow through on implementation. And so, 
you know, the, the leader, project leadership, which was sort of um, organically sort of defined uh, at the time, or in the, like 2004, early in the process, um, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we were willing to figure it out. And so we ended up uh, creating uh, an agency, Atlanta Beltline Inc., to implement it. Um, there's a partner nonprofit organization called the Beltline Partnership. But in reality, um, they're sort of the leaders of the project, but it takes every agency and organization to do it. All, obviously, City Hall. The project is entirely within the city limits of Atlanta, uh, but the political simplicity stops there because it uh, touches 11 of the city, 11 of the 12 city council districts, and uh, 23 of the 26 neighborhood planning units, and so it's, you know, politically very complex in that way. Um, but you know, regionally, the Atlanta Regional Commission, the State Department of Transportation, the all, federal agencies have all been a part of it. The Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Transportation, and so the there's no, it's it's a amazingly sort of complex. But 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 we organize ourselves organically around the project, and similarly, the organizations um, sort of took lead on different aspects of that. So Atlanta's Beltline Inc.'s charge is building the project. They also coordinate with uh, the different agencies at the local, regional, state, and federal level. Yeah, so a really powerful, bold idea. Yeah. <laughs> and then people get behind it. Yeah. So we might um, see if we've got some questions I can sort of see out there. Does, uh, is anyone there to kick us off? Oh, right, well, yep. is that, yeah, right at the back. And yep. maybe if you could um, just introduce yourself when you... Um, we can't, it's bright down here, so thanks, Eric. Hello, hello, my name's Gary Moore. Oh, hello, Gary. Um, I want to ask a question of how we keep an inclusive community mm -hmm. because I'm aware that you took parts of the city that were where a lot of poorer people lived, yes, and they slowly will gentrify. How do you maintain that existing population in that area yep. and grow that area? Right. It's, it's the most critical question that we're facing today. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, cities uh, globally and certainly uh, in the U.S. are growing very rapidly in the, in the center and, uh, and the threat of uh, economic and cultural displacement is real. Uh, it's certainly real on in Atlanta on the Beltline, as, as an example, the notion that the, that the neighborhood that Dr. King was born in and preached in will soon, if it's not already, be a predominantly white neighborhood is, um, is alarming um, and very challenging when you think about the sort of city's identity and, and what matters. And so um, it's definitely an issue. Um, what we, what, because that movement in the beginning of the project though was organic and it was truly inclusive, um, we were just a bunch of dreamers thinking about some pipe dream idea that we didn't ever, body really believed we would actually do. And so it was, it was a very inclusive group of people, uh, communities that sort of bought into it. And intuitively I think uh, the neighborhoods, uh, all the neighborhoods, but in particular the low in, lower income uh, communities who were who saw that potential uh, threat of displacement, I think they understood intuitively that the answer to that is not to not improve the neighborhood. The answer is not to hold communities down just to keep them affordable or to not invest in parks and transit and grocery stores and things like that. That the answer is not to not do those things. The challenge is economic, it's rising taxes and rents. And there are tools that we can put in place to do that. And so. The follow through is to make sure that we not only create the physical vision for the city and that we follow through on implementing it, but that we also follow through on the other aspect of the vision, which is that it's inclusive of everybody. And so that, that will require of us in Atlanta to, to put in place uh, several different kinds of policies and investments to support people, um, some of which we're doing and some of which we're not yet doing. Um, but that's, I think that's the answer is that, you know, is to make sure that especially um, the affordability is protected. I think cultural displacement is a, is a different kind of a problem with much harder solutions. But if, if, if the communities are affordable, 
then you know people at least have a chance of being a part of that. Um, because the project, that early movement was uh, inclusive, then when it came time to create our first funding mechanism, which is a tax increment finance district, I don't believe you have the tool here to do that, but it's a, it leverages property taxes to pay for a public amenity. Um, uh, there was a discussion about that and the housing, the people who cared about affordable housing were at the table because they were part of our vision. And so they demanded that 15% of that tax district go to affordable housing. And there were certainly people who didn't want that to happen, but they couldn't get the, the tax district approved without it. And so that became embedded in that project. It will build 5,600 units of affordable workforce housing, uh, which is a significant investment. It's not nearly enough. Uh, but it's, uh, it's one aspect, it's one part of that, of that puzzle. The reality to the economics and the affordability question is that, you know, we're all different. We, there are, um, some of us are um, on very low income or somewhat low income or even middle income are threatened by that kind of rising uh, land real estate values. Um, some of us are renters, some of us own our homes, some are seniors, families, single parents, seniors, uh, students, artists, you know, different people have different um, challenges at different points of time in their lives. And so the answers to the question is not one single thing, but lots of things that we have to do. And I think that's partly what makes it so uh, challenging to cities to follow through on, because it's not just one thing that you have to do. It's a whole uh, portfolio of things that you have to do. And they're going to be slightly different for different cities based on the the way that the financing works or the politics or the, what the opportunities or needs are, uh, but we have to follow through. What's very clear though, in Atlanta for sure, is that we, um, we know what the answers are. You know, when you, when you boil it down to economic uh, tools to help solve people's affordability problem, we know what those tools are. You go to the housing forum, there's 80 people that can tell you 80 answers and we need to do those things. Um, the problem isn't that we don't know what to do, the problem is that we don't do it. And that's politics, and that's that cultural momentum that I'm talking about, that we have to, um, we have to change our expectation for our city uh, sufficiently um, that we will also follow through on those policies and make sure that we're achieving them. And I, you know, it's a, it's a messy process, and we're, we have not done, um, you know, we've got a long way to go. We have not made all the best decisions, but, you know, I think we have done a lot of things right, and I'm pretty optimistic that we will um, invest in that future. So time will tell, but um, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. There are uh, these other projects I'm talking about. Some of them are completely ignoring the same question, and some of them are embracing it. There's a project in Washington, D.C. called the 11th Street Bridge. It's a new bridge over the Anacostia River. It's actually built on the foundation of an old bridge, but it's a new pedestrian bridge over the river. It connects Anacostia, which is one of the last, um, maybe the last predominantly African-American neighborhood in, wa in Washington, which is astonishing in and of itself to say. Um, but the, th the anxiety around gentrification there is really high, and they have embraced a full, fully uh, that question and making sh finding tools and looking at ways to um, implement a vision that supports the community there. Because the answer is not to not build the bridge. You know, the answer is um, to follow through on that investment with the policies that support people. Yeah. And frankly, that's true of any investment. You know, we build highways all the time in the states that have a very direct impact on cities of depopulation and disinvestment in the center city. And we do it anyway. We've been doing it for 60 years. We know what the outcome is gonna be, and we still do it. And so the, we should be asking these questions for these sort of catalyst infrastructure projects, but we should also be asking those same questions for all the infrastructure that we build and make sure that whatever we build, because it's going to shape our way of life, whether we're conscious of it or not, um, that, that, that it delivers the kind of outcomes that, that we want. Graham, got another question, another one right at the back, is that Eric up there? While we're waiting, I, I did tour the, the red zone uh, earlier uh, yesterday and it's, um, you all are, uh, it's an exciting, um, obviously emotional, but also 
exciting sort of challenge um, to think about. Go ahead. Uh, Ryan, you said a lot about uh, stories and about the inactive power of stories. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you create a, an effective story for a city. Because it's something that we're very much struggling with here. Mm -hmm. I mean, for years and years, we were the Garden City, which didn't tell us a hell of a lot, didn't tell anyone else very much either. And then we sort of became the Earthquake City, which is not yeah. a story you really want to live with for very long. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How do we create a story which is more sort of forward-looking and uh, that we can identify with uh, for the future? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And, I, and you know, I think that what, what the story is, is is something that you will have to write you know, yourselves and, and you will, whether you want to or not. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, that maybe I walk around with like rose-colored glasses looking at everything and I'll <laughs> see only kind of opportunity. Um, but it seems like there is a beautiful kind of story that can emerge from here about uh, regeneration and what a community does, uh, how a community can pull together across different sort of, um, you know, divisions or perspectives or whatever to um, deliver an outcome for this amazing, beautiful sort of opportunity uh, connecting the city to the sea and, um, and this tremendous amount of land and take a tragedy and sort of make it into something that um, is unparalleled. Um, you know, cities everywhere would love to have, I mean, they don't want the earthquake, of course, but the, the opportunity and the devastation, I don't mean to make light of it, but I mean, it, it happened, you know, and, it, and it's part of your story. And I think looking ahead of what, that's, what the next chapter is will, will, will allow people also to heal from, from this chapter. And so um, a willing, you know, I think it takes time, you know, and, and it will certainly take time to, to implement anything. Um, but you wanna be very thoughtful and careful about it and make sure that it's inclusive. And, um, but wow, what a, what a beautiful kind of story out of, out of this tragedy to have something happen. I mean, you know, it takes a lot of time. We, all the, the two and a half years we were going around, that wasn't just, uh, simple meetings. I mean, that's hard work. You know, that's uh, meeting, also meeting in hallways and uh, bar rooms and other kinds of places with people, hand-holding people through a process that, you know, while it, lack, it lacks the sort of trauma of what happened here, you know, for a lot of these communities, they've been in this very slow process of a similar kind of devastation for generations and watch everything that they have sort of be taken away from them and opportunities uh, denied them and promises made and broken um, just over a longer extended period of time. And so they have um, similar kinds of uh, um, fears and anxieties about that, that, they're, that something's gonna happen here that's not, uh, that doesn't include them. And so, you know, I think taking the time to uh, figure out what that is as a as a city as a pro, you know as is important and you know that looks different for different communities because people communicate differently and and operate differently but um, mm. I don't know if that answers sufficiently your question but uh, I don't know that that's really more maybe more up to you but I it's as somebody who looks at these kinds of questions as for a living I mean. The, the, there's no shortage in sort of different kinds of stories that you could tell or different narratives that you could create. Um, you just have to find out what is most authentic and interesting and inspiring to you. Great. Can we go? Okay, yep. And actually, just one more thing. Um, I think it's also important to see that it doesn't, ha it's not any one narrative, you know. I think that there are different narratives for different people. One of the appealing things for the Beltline is that some people like it for the transit, some people like the trail. I mentioned the woman who liked it because the economic opportunity that it was gonna create for her business. You know, people like it for different reasons. Because it's programmatically very broad, it, it brings a lot of people in to the story. They will tell their own stories. There is a shared kind of story, but there are also individual stories. The woman who created the uh, Lantern Parade, Chantel Ritter, she's got an amazing story. And uh, she gets, uh, now she does lantern parades all over the country, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> astonishing. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way, it's not only a shared story in sort of this, this space, 
um, this thing, uh, but also what people do with it, you know, in their own lives and the opportunities that it creates for people. Sorry, I'm going to tell me. Uh, given the political complexity and other challenges associated with uh, these catalyst projects, do you think there are times where smaller, uh, more localized projects would be more effective uh, as instruments of change? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot, obviously, there's a, a lot of uh, movement everywhere now on sort of uh, uh, DIY kind of placemaking, uh, tactical urbanism kind of projects. I think that they uh, often, many of these projects are actually start out that way. The larger projects kind of start out that way um, or use those tactical, more tactical measures to uh, demonstrate uh, what a larger project would look like or how it would operate. Um, we have some short-term uh, projects as part of the Beltline and in, in the areas that haven't been implemented, we'll open them up as just basic hiking trails, uh, take the old railroad and open it up for people to use. Um, it doesn't have to be big, complicated, expensive things. But I think that the cultural momentum that I'm talking about, the, these catalyst projects are part of that, but there's a lot of other parts to it and that the tactical urbanism sort of piece is, is another part of it, but so is like the, local food movement and craft brewery. I mean, all these things kind of are really emerging over the last 10 or 20 years. And I think suggest that, you know, we want something else. We like the global travel and the ability to communicate and the uh, new digital world that we all live in. But we also, in, in a ironic sort of twist of that, want to feel more connected to a place, um, to a locality and, and, and food and um, drink, especially in art and craft and making things, you know, really are part of that. So the, the momentum that I'm talking is much broader than just the sort of infrastructure piece of it, but they're, from an infrastructure perspective, that's the, these are the bigger projects that are helping to, to define that, that part of it. Mm -hmm. got, oh, sorry, straight around the front, Laura. A mic is on its way. <laughs> You have a glass of wine. Ryan, I really like your um, your values-based urban development kind of approach. Yeah. That's really special. Um, the, given your focus on, you mentioned equity, progress, and ambition, so like creating change, do you think there's scope for the development agency to um, find ways for the Beltline to provide economic support to the hyper-local communities around it through things like giving them, giving locals the maintenance contracts, maybe giving locals ownership of the asset. Is yep. the asset still in the government? Um, Assets. Does the asset. government still own no, the asset? Does the infrastructure. Oh, yeah. Um, right now, the, the Atlanta Belt and Inc. Uh, has a jobs program where the, where the contractors that they hire to implement parks and trail projects uh, are required to uh, include a certain percentage of local um, people from the community to help support. And, and in order to do that, there's training programs to make sure that people have the skills to do that. Um, there are more broadly, uh, and this is part of, you know, we're still very much in the midst of doing this especially on the implementation side. And so there's, there is some um, movement from the economic development folks to find uh, tools to help people, because uh, a lot of the changes coming comes through like restaurants, coffee shops, those kinds of things. That, does, that doesn't have to be somebody else's coffee shop that moves into your neighborhood. You could actually open up a, a, um, a coffee shop and, and build you know, a new business for yourself. And, um, build generational wealth for yourself and your family, just much like that woman did with her fashion design business. And so, but a lot of people don't have the access to capital, they don't have the skills, the tool, the training, they don't know what to do to do that. And so there's a little bit of movement to try to create that package to help people do that or sort of some sort of task force to help people do that. Um, we're not quite there yet, but there, um, is that what you were asking? I want to make sure I answer the question, but I might have missed a... Yeah, I, was just, I guess I was thinking about the... Um, it's a highly valuable asset now, and the city will derive great revenues as a result of this infrastructure being built. Yep. 
is it necessary for the city to retain asset ownership, or could the ownership of the asset be kind of parceled up to the neighbouring communities so that oh. they can then rightfully derive the economic benefits from them? Oh, I got you. Um, you know, the, 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 the project is really just the infrastructure itself, the corridor, all the stuff happening alongside of it is primarily uh, private sector. Um, the public sector doesn't have the money to buy a lot of adjacent land and then do what I think you're saying. Um, and any revenue generated by the quarter itself um, would really need to be put back into maintenance of the quarter because there's no funding stream for that either. Um, so we're, the, the financing of this project and projects like it are really challenging because where I come from, we don't pay for things. And so uh, <laughs> we have to come up with creative ways to do it. And so, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. There is, there is, an, there is talk of um, potentially hiring a um, private firm to just build it and they would be paid back uh, with uh, r different revenue st streams over, over time. We'd be giving up something for that, and I think from a public sector standpoint, so it'd be, um, that'll be an interesting kind of discussion about whether that's even possible or not. But conceivably, you could see some scenario like you're talking about built into that. Uh, I think it's probably uh, unlikely, but possibly. Oh, next door. Um, Christchurch needs uh, more people living here, and mm -hmm. I was impressed by your growth, projected growth figure, um, and I was wondering if that growth is derived from people moving there because of the infrastructure you've created, so they're moving there in hope of getting an employment, mm -hmm. or if they're moving there because of the employment created by the extra um, development that's gone in, mm -hmm. um, and if you've got any recommendations or suggestions for Christchurch to grow its population. Um, sure. You know, I think a lot of the growth uh, in Atlanta would probably happen anyway. Um, it's mostly uh, the number of the jobs, the e economy of, of the city, um, the frustration with traffic in the suburbs and people wanting to not have to get in it. And so they're living closer to where they work and moving into the city. Um, a lot of people moving from other uh, cities where they uh, have a different expectation for a more urban kind of lifestyle and that's what they want. Um, certainly the Beltline and, and the urbanization of, of the city generally um, plays a role in, in attracting growth and relevant to your question I think most closely is that I have young people uh, tell me all the time that the Beltline is either the reason that they're staying or the reason that they move there because it gives them, uh, even though it's not complete at all, it gives them hope that, uh, or confidence that Atlanta is gonna become the place that they want to invest their lives in, um, and the, the kind of city that they want, and they wanna gr raise a family and, and grow in. And so I think as a, as a, you know, city, people today, especially young people, could kind of live anywhere they want in lots of ways, and so cities have to compete in a way. They have to make sure that they are creating a lifestyle for people that, peop that people will want. And so I think um, that's what the Beltline is certainly doing um, for Atlanta. The, the big old series building I, I mentioned um, has a lot of tech uh, and startup kind of firms there. Um, they're locating there because those neighborhoods along that corridor are where their talent, you know, the young employees want to live. And so um, the Beltline in that way is, is a infrastructure for that that population attraction um, to, of young, creative, talented, tech savvy kind of people um, certainly playing a role um, with that. And so I think that creating the kind of infrastructure for that attracts that kind of population is important, uh, is sort of a, one way of thinking about um, this is, um, so I don't know if that makes I don't, I don't know enough about um, who lives here and what kinds of things um, they do, but I think that, um, I mean, you've got so much going for you already. I mean, what a beautiful uh, country and <laughs> a lot of a massive amount of investment here now, and so it's, it's got a lot of excitement around it. So um, this would be maybe 
another an additional kind of layer, but I don't know. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. I've only been here for a couple of days, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Up down the front. Hi, Ryan. Partly asking a question on behalf of our online um, listeners tonight okay. and watchers. Just with some of the projects you've talked about, they're obviously industrial um, landscapes already, and so while they have these polit political implications, they're perhaps not as sensitive as the red zone here, which was a residential zone. I just wondered if you had any tips for us about how to negotiate that, because whatever happens there, it it means developing over what was a community and what was people's homes. Right. So um, just any advice you have around that too? <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, obviously it, it adds a layer of, um, of, you know, of a real challenge. Um, it's really, I know, still very raw kind of emotion for people. Um, I don't think that there's an easy answer to that. Um, I think that there are, uh, from a design standpoint, certainly ways to um, layer in uh, sort of memory about uh, the lives that people had there that I think would be allow, um, allow the space to sort of um, have, have a sense of uh, history to it that would be really important. There's a, I was telling somebody earlier there's a, and this is a very small, very different kind of project, but there was a, uh, there's a park in the city, it's across the street from my daughter's uh, school. Um, it was um, made out of a bunch of house lots. The houses were torn down for a highway. Um, the highway, the neighborhood fought the highway uh, and they won, but these houses had already been torn down and so they um, made, the, made it into a park. And at each of the houses, they left the stair, the little outdoor staircase that goes from the sidewalk up to the house. Uh, they left it as sort of a memory of each uh, house. And that was, even though the park where the houses were, were now, you know, volleyball courts and playgrounds and other kinds of things, um, having that sense of history to the place um, is important. I think also just thinking ahead um, of, you know, in, in 50 years, um, there will still be people around who remember that, but there will also be a lot of people who, for them, the red zone has always been there. And so it's seen in a different kind of light. And, um, and I think being able to see it uh, sort of from a future kind of retrospective point uh, might also be, be helpful. But, you know, I think um, there aren't a lot of places in the world that have, that are dealing with this that I'm aware of in, in, in terms of building something, infrastructure, public space, whatever it would be, um, with that kind of emotional sort of context. I'm, my, my family is all from Louisiana, and um, so we're, you know, New Orleans, when New Orleans went through the Katrina, and uh, the transformation that's really happened there is, is painful for a lot of people, and, um, and it's, there's not a red zone like you have here, but it is uh, very much affected families and lives and, and the politics coming out of that are very different from what they were before. And, um, and some people feel included and not included. And, you know, I think it, you can't ignore the emotion and the, it's real for people. I mean, these are our lives. And like I said, we're building the lives for ourselves and that includes people who, mm. um, for, for whom this is still very fresh. So um, I think take, taking the time to, to deal with that, but also realizing that over time, um, you know, to see it, to sort of see it over time, I guess. Mm -hmm. There, it's funny, because we've been working on the Beltline for so long that there are young people who, for them, the Beltline has always been an idea, you know, and that, it's just, and it's something that they expect to happen. It's not something that anybody had to happen. So my, actually part of my job today is reminding people how hard it was to do that. And how, and you know, I mentioned that public ownership, that they actually own it. This isn't, it's easy to see the project now as some big government project, but actually its best outcome re requires us to remain active and vigilant and speak up when we need to. And so um, just, reminding young people that 
you know, of that story and telling that story so that they um, will remain active, but also see themselves in it and, and add whatever layers of ideas that they, that they might have. Mm. Well, that is, um, I think, about time. So, unf unfortunately, we, we can't keep going all night. I'd like to, <laughs> it's been a great conversation. And I think um, we would just give Ryan a round of applause. Um, for that. So I think, and then there was so much in that. There's so many stories yeah. and, and, and I suppose lessons and learnings for us and I hope we've all um, got something out of it today, listening to what people can get out of infrastructure and what it can do. And, uh, and I, I love a, a lot of those sayings. I've written a lot down, so thanks very much. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, the evening. Uh, and I'd like to thank the, the team, the people who put that together. Um, special thanks to Jess and Erica from Te Putahi, um, my team who have done a great job with this. And um, there's, there is further events in this Christchurch Conversation series that will come up, so keep your eye on the Regenerate Christchurch website and also the Te Putahi website for details on those. And, um, yeah, thanks again for coming along tonight, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. So, yeah, cheers. Thank you. Thanks, right? yeah. Thanks.